insight. We'd like to introduce our next speaker, Howard Tolman. He is the executive director of the Kaplan Institute for Innovation and Tech Entrepreneurship at Illinois Tech. Mr. Tolman is the former CEO of 1871 and the general managing partner of G2T3V LLC and CHIP LLC, which are Chicago-based early stage venture funds. He is a member of Chicago Next, the Cultural Affairs Council, and of the Illinois Arts Council, a professor at IIT and Kellogg, and advises many startups. Over the last 50 years, he has successfully founded more than a dozen high-tech companies. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Howard Tolman. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you. All right, so my first job is going to be to figure out which clicker I should click with. So let me start by saying that uh, I have a little bad news, which is there's, uh, there's been a really alarming number of changes here that you know nothing about. But here's the good news. Those changes occur so quickly that uh, tomorrow there'll be a different set of things to worry about. And this thing about change is that it turns out uh, that it's not really an apple hitting you on the head. It's not really lightning striking. It's when you feel the heat and when the pressure of the competition and things that are going on all around you really rolls up that you start to understand uh, the necessity for change. We get that nobody likes change, by and large, but here's the thing, change isn't hard. What's hard is overcoming the resistance to change, what really worked for you in the past reasonably well and which just isn't gonna work at all in the future. And that's really sort of the situation that we're in and what we have to deal with. And frankly, it's better to change than it is to disappear. If you wanna uh, sort of check out how accurate this is, take a look at your blackberries and uh, that'll give you some idea of what the world looks like today. And in fact, you know, one of the things that's really surprising to us is that if you look at how things have changed in terms of the market, in the not too distant past, less than 10 years ago really, these were the leaders and today, the only thing that's a mystery to us is what is Microsoft still doing on this list? Because let's face it, they basically missed everything. They missed the web, they missed search, they missed the mobile. Uh, but the reason that they're still around really is because they're so entrenched in terms of the desktop world and because we're lazy and because inertia is such a critical situation with respect to what's going on. So when we talk about business models, what we're talking about constantly is change. You're all familiar with Uber, you're all familiar with Lyft. You may not appreciate the real magic here, which is that 90% of the time our cars sit around anyway. And so it's, it, you know, BMW calls it the ultimate driving machine. The truth is it's probably the ultimate parking machine. Uh, and in fact, in four out of the five top cities, it's cheaper to have Uber as your principal transportation than it is to own a car. And so that's where we're headed. Every kind of different and new model, we're seeing now subscription models. Basically, Volvo and a whole bunch of other folks have addressed and created bundles where everything is included. And so if you look at it, it's not just Volvo, by the way, it's Cadillac, it's Porsche, it's Ford. And essentially what they're saying is that transportation is just a commodity, like so many other things, and that this idea of ownership is not important. It's not important to these next couple of generations. It's about utility, it's about the experiences, but it's really not about ownership. Give you an idea, in hospitality, what's going on, Airbnb is just killing it, and one of the reasons is that even the best hotels don't want to have empty rooms, and so, in the fairly near future, we expect that Airbnb will be the back door to a lot of these hotels. And frankly, they learned the lesson from the airlines, which is that nobody wants to have an empty seat and nobody wants to have an empty room. And about midday, when the guy's looking at 30 or 40 empty rooms, you can imagine that he figures out pretty quickly that it makes sense to talk to a fire hose of opportunities, which is really what Airbnb represents. To show you, though, the scale of the change, if you look at the giant Marriott and you look at Hilton, those two organizations have 400,000 employees. And they have a market cap, as you can see, that's roughly comparable. 
and frankly, Airbnb is closing in on Marriott uh, as we talk. Any idea of how many employees Airbnb has? 3,500 employees. Look at the scale, look at the reduction, and try to figure out what's the world going to look like when millions of people are out of jobs and have to figure out something to do, to do with their lives because of technology and because of these changes. And this change is not something that's going to happen when we get around to it. It's happening now in every respect. The Dick Tracy watch, we've got it today. The Jetsons, we've got air taxis in Dubai that literally let you pick up and, and fly around. The Star Wars Cantina, Google Pod, you put it in your ear, it translates 40 languages simultaneously. And that's just the beginning. You know, TSA sucks, but pretty soon you're going to be able to just stick your eye up to the clearance and blow right through. And so this will be extended everywhere. Facial recognition, voice recognition, all these new tools. This is a system that lets you turn on your car by basically just looking into the rear view mirror. And so robots are coming too. Now it's not going to be Wally necessarily, but we have personal robots that will follow you around. You can send it home with your gear or your equipment. Domino's is delivering using pizza robots now. They're using and experimenting with autonomous vehicles for delivery. We've got the drone situation going on. And the truth is, with respect to all of this stuff, the message is that the way you did business is changing. And the way that every business did business is changing, and it's changing radically. It's not going to be a little different. It's going to be a big bump. That's going to be a really nasty ride if you're not prepared. And if you don't start thinking about what the drivers are for industry and for businesses going forward. Speaking about drivers, these guys are about to lose several million jobs. Now, understand that some of these guys should get out of the cab. There's just no question, really. But as far as the rest of them goes, you know, when you've got Uber Freight and when you've got Tesla announcing vehicles with enormous range and opportunities, you can see what's coming. Amazon, stores with no cashiers. There are more cashiers in this country than teachers, 11 million cashiers. And guess what? It's not just the ATM. It's not just the self-service lines at the grocery stores. It's everything that's changing. We're seeing more and more bots. And bots are simple lines of code that eliminate enormous amounts of work and effort. And JP Morgan just implemented just the first of these that tracks IP transactions and tickets. That's about 140 jobs. And then they looked at what we call smart contracts. And pretty amazingly, smart contracts basically are going to prevent lawyers from saying, gee, I spent at $800 an hour, 47 hours looking at the same contract that I've looked at 152 times this year. 360,000 hours a year eliminated in seconds. And that's just the beginning. The computers are better than we are at facial recognition. And if you think facial recognition is easy, let me tell you that the difference basically between the mutt and the muffin is not that clear. It's not that super obvious. And so it's a little harder and a little more challenging than we think. But here's the bottom line. If I can take a job and I can reduce it to a set of rules or instructions, if I can say, do your job great, do it over and over again, those jobs are going to be automated and they're going to go away, whether it's security, whether it's inventory, whether it's warehousing, all going away. And so when we look at the world today, we look at three buckets. We look at the jobs that still have a little magic, managing other people, levels of expertise. They're OK for a little while longer. If you're dealing with customers, if you're doing unpredictable work, you're OK. But if you're doing data collection and data processing and repeatable, predictable physical work, you're basically toast. And so everything is automating and everything is speeding up. And when we talk about speed, speed is the most important competitive advantage. And as you may, some of you may know, I'm learning to trade uh, options with Tom. And every show, twice a week, he reminds me of how fast the platform is. So I, I just want to say the platform is fucking A fast. All right, anyway, <laughs> putting that aside, the truth is if you're not in a big hurry, you're probably too late. And think of playing the entire game. Think of playing your entire business in overtime, because that's what we're dealing with. We call this autocatalytic. And what that means is that every change accelerates 
the next change, what's next coming down the pipe, and you have to keep up with that. And here's the first question to ask about your business and what you're doing. It's not how fast you're doing today, that's a measure of velocity. It's how fast are you getting faster? How fast are you accelerating the rate of change within your own organization? And that's how we measure it. And frankly, if the people outside are changing faster, then you're going in the wrong direction. And here's something to take home and tell your kids, that today is the slowest rate of change, the slowest rate of change that we will experience for the rest of our lives. It's not going to get easier, and it's not going to get slower. And so when we talk about technology, we don't just say, look, how can it help us do what we've done always better? That's half the question. But the other question is this, how can it let us do things we couldn't imagine doing before? New changes, new ways of approaching things. One of the things we talk about is 3D printing. Now, today Yoda is still the most fabricated object, very, very important, and kids all over the country are wasting plastic and making shit like this. But think about this, <laughs> that 30% of the plastic parts that are delivered to a car dealership each week cost more to ship the part there than the part costs. And so think about where we're headed. And where we're headed is to an opportunity where we'll do just-in-time fabrication. We'll have no inventory costs. We'll have no transportation costs. And the implications going up and down the supply chain are significant. This is a fabrication that you couldn't do in steel. It's stronger than steel. It's lighter and cheaper than aluminum. But Molten metal doesn't know how to create these structures. And so those are the kinds of opportunities, the kinds of new things that we can do going forward. Where is the stuff going to come from? Well, it's not going to be in your core business. It's really going to be at the edges. It's really going to be in businesses that are adjacent to your business, who are doing changes. And we do a lot of stealing. We do a lot of sort of shifting because it's really, really important to see what's working wherever it's working, and then to apply that intelligence to your own business. So we don't think that Uber is a better sort of taxi company. It was a completely different platform. And we don't think that uh, basically the Tesla is a car with a few chips. We think of it as a computer on wheels. And you know, if you want to look at your business, here's a chart. I'd say if you want to take a picture of one slide, this is the slide. Because every day, 500 companies in 1871 look at every business that's out there and they say, how can we eat their lunch? And this is a process that you need to do as well. You need to look at what you're doing across these vectors of change and competition and say, how can I do it better? Who are my customers? What am I delivering? When and where and how do I do that? That's part one. You need to do an audit. And after you do the audit, you need to do something else because you can't be all things to all people. So you have to ask yourself, what's my edge? What's the thing that's going to differentiate me? It could be customers. It could be distribution. It could be size and scale. But you need to double down on your edge. You want to get rid of the stuff that can be done by anybody, the stuff that's a commodity. And you want to build something that's really unique and really special. And that's the nature of what's going on. You cannot do all things. You've got to focus on your edge. And you've got to do it before someone else does it to you. And when we talk about that, we talk all the time about this guy. And frankly, if he's worried about somebody coming along and stealing his 2 billion customers, then we should be shitting bricks. You'll excuse my French. But the idea of all of this is that nobody is safe. No business is going to continue the way it has been. And so the trick is to look at what's driving these changes. And we think there are 10 simple ideas that are driving these changes. Number one is time. Time is absolutely the scarcest resource that we have. We have hundreds of businesses that are on-demand businesses and businesses that are responsive to this desire. These businesses range from serving students. These deliver things that students need in five minutes on campus. This does customer service and support in three and a half minutes. Try to be in a business that says, I'll get back to you in 24 to 48 hours. You won't be in business much longer. This is an ugly, ugly device, but it downloads a full length film to your laptop in one to three minutes at the airport. So all of this is acceleration, but Amazon, always Amazon, they're shipping you stuff you haven't even bought yet. Now, how do they do that? Okay, well, 
they look at previous orders, they look at the contents of your wish list, a lot of things, but they focus on something that we call cursor hover time. And what is that? Cursor hover time is digital drooling. That's you looking at stuff that you haven't bought yet. And what are they doing? Well, they're looking out of the computer at the same time, and they're changing the price, and they're bundling things, and they're offering you all kinds of other incentives. And that's how Amazon plays the game. And then, of course, they deliver it to you in no time at all. And so that's the nature of what's happening. The second component is to understand how pivotal voice is going to be. Voice is everything going forward. Email is dying. We don't open email. We don't respond to email. And frankly, text isn't that much better. It's a little better because it's interruptive. But the real truth is that voice is four times faster than text. And so walking in and dealing with command structures like Alexa and Siri and those things is only going to get more so. And whether it's the Amazon Echo or whether it's the growth in the skills, 30,000 Alexa skills already, uh, this is what's coming. And it's coming across the board. It's going to be the operating system of the home within the next two years. And that's just the beginning because as it continues to grow, we're seeing that it reinforces economic behavior that is highly, highly desirable. So first, penetration, but second, attachment and connection. It increases purchases. It increases the desire to reorder and replenishment in powerful ways, and it busts brands because brands don't matter in the world of voice. Number three is this idea of the right now economy. Everything you want and everybody wants it right now. Nobody wants to wait for anything. So whether it's your phone that provides in-store information or products that are going to talk to you going forward or the ability to order your groceries at the train station or the bus stop or to go to a game and use your phone or a basketball game, use your phone, look at the back of the guy's jersey, up pops a buy button, you buy it, we'll have it in your home before you get out of the parking lot at the end of the game. That's speed, that's fulfillment, and by the way, once that bar rises, it never comes back. It never comes back. And so you have to design the services, the products, the things that you are going to offer to your customers to be responsive to their demands and their needs. They don't come to you anymore. You have to figure out how to be wherever they are. And as I said before, their expectations only grow. And here's the trick. When they experience this hyperspeed in any part of their life, they apply it to everything. So if you can go into Walgreens and get a flu shot in five minutes at your convenience, how much longer do you think you're going to fart around for three weeks waiting for the doctor to give you an appointment and charge you a couple hundred dollars and you'll get the flu before you get there? So the idea, the idea of I want it and I want it now is critical, critical to the whole thing. What was great yesterday, so what today? The bar keeps rising. And it, when I talk about nobody wanting to wait for anything, you know, we thought that the internet was going to turn us into couch potatoes. What's happened instead is that we're perfectly happy to go pick this stuff up. And this has enormous implications for drive-throughs, for on-site ordering. This is a new thing. Pretty much all the malls now you'll see building kiosks where you can drive up and they'll have assembled the packages for you. This you'll see in stores. These lockers are controlled by your phone. They're what you ordered online. You blow into the store, you open the locker, and you're gone. Now again, only Amazon thinks that this is too slow. So they have a little thing called the dash button. What do you do with the dash button? Well, you put it on your washing machine, and when you're out of tide, you press the button. It costs a dollar, but they give you the dollar back the first time you order. And in about an hour and a half, there'll be a new container of tide at your doorstep. How easy is that? In, in my wife's pantry, there's 16 of these buttons already. It's frightening. But she doesn't want to go to the store. 200 brands have adopted this. Now, in almost every single case, it's obvious where the button should go. In some cases, it's a little more confusing. But the idea, the idea is the same. And so again, I want it. I want it right now. I don't care about choice. I'm pretty much insensitive to price but I need everything easy and now. And so 
We use a new score. We don't use net promoter. We don't talk about CSI. We talk about customer effort score. What that really means is simple. And you can test this too. You can call your shop. You can call your business. You can look at the way you do business. Check out your website. And frankly, if it's not easy to do business with your business, then I'm going to go somewhere else. And you can measure this across a lot of different dimensions. Transit time, how many people do I have to deal with? How quickly can I get my questions answered? And all of that factors into this idea of friction. And businesses need to be fundamentally friction free because that's the standard. The consumer also wants to drive. And when I say they want to drive, what I mean is they want what they want, when they want it, wherever they are, without asking. They want to set the price. They want to figure out the timing. They want it to be interactive. And this is true for all content these days and for all deliverables. The consumer really wants to be in control. And again, you have to address those needs, and your businesses have to be responsive to that. And so here's an interesting idea. How can you be all things to each person well, the answer is what we call mass customization. And this was not possible in the recent past. And by the way, the big brokerage companies still haven't figured this out. The big broker brokerage companies will ship you a book that is just slightly smaller than the phone book used to be. And that tells you a lot about how much they know about their connection to you. But today, today in the world, scale and precision are not mutually exclusive. Today, we can actually focus in on customization. If every one of you went right now to the Amazon homepage, here's what you would see. Your own screen, customized for you, times 350 million screens. That's the nature of what's going on. When you talk about a broker-dealer, you don't want to know generally what the world looks like. You want to know what relates to you in real time and what's operative and actionable. And so, those are the standards that are going to be exported and deal with the way we deal with every kind of business. All driven by data. Data is magic today. It's power. And it helps us direct the use of scarce resources. And if we don't figure out how to do this well, then somebody else will. Advertising, that just means that you're boring. It means you're paying a penalty because you haven't figured out how to engage me in direct one-to-one -one connections. Marketing, even worse. I think that marketers are, you know, might as well just jump out of a, out of a cage anytime soon. Anyway, I'm sorry. So, so engagement, connection to the customers, really, really important. And part of the design of good businesses going forward. It's not about search engine optimization. It's not about a lot of things. What it's really about is how do I connect to you and deliver services that are highly customized, really important and actionable. If you can do that, then you can go forward. So what's driving this? Well, what's driving this is this interesting idea that we're not looking backwards anymore. We're able to look forward. And so we're able to anticipate and interfere with and improve the consumer experience rather than just reacting to it. So whether it's real estate, where Google is more accurate than the real estate industry, just as an example, whether it's Target, who knew that this uh, guy's daughter was pregnant, he didn't know, he wondered why they were sending her all this maternity stuff, pretty scary. Uh, TiVo, you know, what this guy had to do was watch 14 football games and three army movies in order to sort of square this thing out. Very <laughs> uh, These people will buy your house in three days, all data driven, amazing, amazing. Try to look what the real estate industry is gonna look like in the near future. And then, the credit cards people, always creepy, are predicting early divorces. How do they do this? Okay, same city hotel charges, flowers sent to some place that isn't your home. Buffing up, okay, singles bars. Now, why do they do this? Well, they are perverts, but that's not why they do it, actually. They do it because of an observed behavior, which is that when you're about to get divorced, all those credit card charges were incurred by your soon-to-be ex-spouse, and so you disown them. So these are algorithms that prevent that behavior, that spike behavior and that reallocation behavior. And again, it just continues. This is a really interesting thing. We can use the data now in the grocery store to offer you two choices. And if you look closely at what's going on, 
On the left-hand side, the stuff has been there for a little while, so you pay half price. If you're going to use it tonight, who cares? But if you want it to last three days, you pay retail. And this is just the beginning of dynamic pricing and algorithmic pricing. And that's going to go on everywhere. In San Francisco, already the pricing is demand-driven. And we're going to see more and more instances about this. And so this is an interesting thing. People thought the web was about low cost and immediacy. Certainly it was. But what it was really about is measurement. Today we can measure things we never guessed or imagined that we could measure. And so every business is going to be subject to two words, two ideas. Transparency, it's going to be a fair assumption that everyone who does business with you will know what you're doing, your employees, your customers, your clients, your competitors. And efficacy, they'll know how well you're doing it. And if you're not doing it well, guess what? They're going somewhere else because choice is virtually unlimited, hold on one second, unlimited on the web. Now, this has driven us to create a new idea and a new definition of loyalty. And it's a little depressing. But the definition goes like this. Loyalty doesn't mean anything more than I haven't seen something better yet. Because we don't own the customers anymore. We don't own the connection. Switching costs are a joke. Because people are mobile, people have flexibility, and so you have to deliver an experience and a compelling connection each and every single time that you interact with the customers. If you don't, then somebody else will own them. You need to get their attention, really hard to do. Our parents said, pay attention. We didn't understand that that was a spendable currency in the new world, but it is because we make time. This was a toy that I had when I was young, Stretch Armstrong, but anyway, we make time in this noisy, busy world for what we're interested in. And it's not just a competitive thing. We're competing for attention against everything that gets in the way of engagement and connection to your customers. And so the trick, to give you some idea, this is the new Tic Tac. And they were so worried that mid suck you'd lose interest that it changes flavors, OK? And it, now, that's pretty scary, but that's not the worst news. The worst news is they compared us to a goldfish in terms of attention about four years ago, Yale. They just updated the study. The goldfish is doing fine. We're losing, OK? <laughs> we're like the dog and the squirrel, OK? Why? Because we're drowning in media. And it's so, so hard to get your message through to engage. And engagement is not about eyeballs. It's about the idea that today, when I reach you, the context in which I reach you is more important than what I say. Because if I'm not listening, it doesn't matter what I say. And so we look at three things. And you need to ask yourself, is your media, is your marketing, is your strategy reaching the right people? Is the message getting through? And are they changing their behavior? And if they're not, then you're wasting your time and money. And so that's the name of the game. We call this smart reach. The ability to deliver engaging, relevant, customized content at the right time and at the right place. If you do that, you're OK. If you don't, you're toast. So what do we need? When do we need it? Wherever we are, fundamentally without asking. This is a very powerful product if you haven't seen it. This tells you when to pee during the movies, during the movies, OK? And it's a very timely. It's kind of one of these delivered you know, services, really significant. This is another one. It'll hook you up with somebody who has the opposite view of you with, on FaceTime. You can scream at each other. It's a great stress reliever, very powerful. But, but the idea of all of this is about attention. And attention is growing a deficit. TV doesn't work anymore, frankly. In the old days, you know, basically, you could get a big audience. You can't command that audience, essentially, anymore for anything. Uh, and you look at Facebook at an enormous difference, talking to literally billions of people every day. Millennials, not there at all. Okay, Most of them are dealing with streaming. Almost none of them are watching traditional TV, mainstream media. Today, if you buy cable, you do it with a chip on your shoulder. Nobody really wants to be captive. Cord cutting, accelerating tremendously. Uh, and so the idea of how we're going to reach people in the future is all video-based. And it's growing really amazingly. In fact, if you look at what's going out there, every one of these services is growing. And here's the interesting thing about this statistic. 
A, Netflix is now bigger than all the cable people combined, and B, Apple and Facebook really haven't made their plays yet in video, but when you look at what they did in some of these other industries, they certainly are a threat to traditional TV. Now, I want to do a quick test. How many of you have a cell phone with you? Okay, good. How many of you brought your TV with you today? All right, so, so the moral of that story is we want it and we want it now, and let me just ask you one more question. How many of you have an Apple phone? Okay, Android? All right, those folks look to your left or your right, you earn half of what the Apple people do. These are the frightening statistics. That's the way the world works. Lots of Android devices out there. Apple is killing it in terms of the high end, the customers that are the most affluent population. It's pretty astonishing. And streaming is growing, and by the way, it's not just for kids. Streaming is growing across every age group because we want a time shift. We want to control these experiences, all driven by the fact that we're connected, as I said. And so in terms of connection, the kids are hyper-connected, but so are we. We did this survey not so long ago. 80% of us check our phone within 15 minutes of when we get up in the morning. I think the other 20% are just lying sacks of shit, but I don't know what they're doing. But in any event, the idea is we interact with these devices an astonishing amount of time. That turns into about three and a half hours a day. We've got tools that actually measure this, and it is pretty scary. And that's just the beginning. The car, also connected. I love these manufacturers who say, please don't text when you drive, and then they show you 400 other things that you can do. And this is, again, just the beginning, okay? Because that video screen in your car is coming alive. This is a service that when your doorbell rings at home, it shows you who's at the door, okay? How interruptive is that, all right? So, but pay attention to your driving, you know, pay attention to your driving. So, you know, it's driven by this stream of constant connected data. And we can see you now in the stores, and we can see you in the aisles, and we can see when you come in whether the windows are working, and how long you spend in the store, and are you a frequent buyer, all of this stuff, which is permitted bricks and mortar to finally catch up with the online world. And you're going to see that in companies like Best Buy, which are really exploding it. And then lastly, things. And we don't call this the Internet of Things. We call it the Internet of Everything, because everything today will be connected. And so whether it's the home or whether it's your home TV. Now understand what's going on in the home TV. It used to be that Nielsen had this little box that sat on top of your TV, and that was how we measured media consumption in the home. Today, eight and a half devices in the home. So who's the Nielsen of tomorrow? It's Comscore. And what have they done? They took that little box and they picked it up off the TV and they moved it to the router. And now it measures everything. Phone and media and tablet and your thermostat, everything. So the data flow is a huge multiple exponentially of what the opportunities are. And again, connection is just beginning to be really significant. Disney. These magic bands let them track everything. They let you walk around the park, but at the same time, they're tracking you. And, and as you increasingly experience what's going on, they can personalize experiences. Goofy will know your kids' names, what city and state you're from. And those experiences are really what they're selling now. That's what the data is permitting us to build. We put these on the cocktail waitresses' trays in Vegas to see that they were servicing the high rollers and not basically the penny slots. They called us back in less than a month and said we need it on our maintenance people, on our security people. The NFL is putting them on the players. We're this close, basically, to a, a time when the computer will tell the coach to pull a guy that his legs are tired because it will have measured how quickly he ran the same route compared to the last time. And data is just beginning. This is astonishing. This guy is the most stolen on pitcher in baseball. Now what happened here? Well, they, he's got this goofy dance of a windup, and it takes whatever it takes, a second and a half, two seconds or something. So they measure the windup, then they measure what it takes for the ball to go to the catcher and what it takes the catcher to throw to second base. And let me tell you that anybody not in a wheelchair or using a cane beats this guy to second base all day long. And so. So this is the beginning 
of data changing the way everything works, better running, better, ten better tennis, better hydration, all of these things, this lets blind people see through image recognition. This changes sign language into speech. This lets you look right through the wall to see what's going on behind the wall. This is a rear view mirror that watches and if your eyelids start to flutter, it vibrates your seat, haptic signaling. Really important. This is a fork that my mother would be very proud of. If you're eating too fast, it starts to vibrate. And so it makes it hard, hard to get the food in your mouth. And she's like, I spent all day cooking that shit. All right, sorry. And this is a spoon that does the opposite. It offsets Parkinson's tremors. Really powerful stuff. This is an umbrella that knows if it's going to rain. Connected pill bottles increase compliance dramatically. And that's just the beginning of the pill revolution. This is a pill that you swallow in lieu of a colonoscopy, we call it the light at the end of the tunnel. And so, <laughs> so this is a little TV camera that measures your entire colon experience. And lastly, smart garbage cans. These are so smart that they tell the truck every day whether they're empty or full. And the routes are dynamically developed every day to not waste fuel. And this is just the beginning, again, of data changing the way we do things that we've traditionally thought were great. You probably don't know this, but UPS trucks do not turn left. Why? Because turning left causes them to crush oncoming traffic and also takes a long time. And so by doing routes that only turn right, they save 10 million gallons of fuel a year. 10 million gallons of fuel because every morning, the truck driver gets a route based on what packages need to be delivered. And so what's going on is that we are surrounded by these new ideas. This is a wallet that knows your budget. And so as the month goes by, it gets harder and harder to open the wallet. I understand, <laughs> I understand that there's both a husband and a wife version of this. I'm not really sure. But the idea is, look, we're drowning in stuff in information, in content, we got to make sense out of it. We got to build systems that permit us to do that. And if we do that, then we can be successful. Make it easy, make it clear and clean and fast, or I'll go somewhere else. So I want to thank you for your time. And before I leave, <clears throat> before I leave, I just want to tell you two quick things more. One is, uh, ancient Rome, you may know that ancient Rome fell. Uh, it fell because they didn't have cell phones. We know this now, because if they had cell phones, there would have been, they would have known about the Mayan civilizations and about the Chinese dynasties, and it would have been a whole different thing. What does this have to do with anything? We have a company at 1871 with a trademark on an amazing word. What's the word? Selfie is the word. Hello, Mr. Clicker. There's some guy in the back trying to keep up with me. He has no chance of doing that. Here's the flash. Selfie is the only word in the history of mankind. God didn't make it, peace didn't make it, love didn't make it, war didn't make it. History of mankind, same word in every language in the world. The rest of the world didn't have time to catch up in their own cultures and create a word for this. That's what the opportunities of globalization and speed really represent. It's pretty astonishing. And then, because you've been a good crowd, I want to leave you with one other thing. So all of us are either parents or we spend a lot of time in bars. And in either case, we need a tool. And the tool is you're constantly dealing with kids who know it all or people in bars who know it all. So we built a little tool for you. And this creates a fake Wikipedia page that supports your side of any argument. What could be better than that? Thank you very much.